Welcome to the Presto Post success series. This is Jay Preston. This show is all about the lessons, secrets, top tips and best advice the world's most successful people have to offer. Each episode will be dedicated to one well-known name, be them artists, writers, actors, investors, businessmen or women, and so on, and the practical wisdom they think will be helpful to you. These podcasts are not done by us, however. Instead, we've taken the best clips and soundtracks we can find on the web, polished them up, and distilled them into what we call nutritious audio snacks. The magic number is seven. This is the number of lessons we aim to fit into each podcast. But we must apologise in advance for the times when we break that rule. Today's guest is Tim Ferriss, a best-selling author, entrepreneur, serial investor, and self-proclaimed human guinea pig. His books include The 4-Hour Body, The 4-Hour Chef, and Tools of Titans. In his latest book, Tribe of Mentors, Tim brings life advice from over 100 eclectic, distinguished people, including billionaire Ray Dalio, the head of TED, Chris Anderson, Maria Sharapova, and Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskowitz. His successful investments include early-stage deals at Facebook, Uber, Twitter, and Shopify, He's also been called the Oprah of audio because of the influence of his podcast, The Tim Ferriss Show, for which downloads have exceeded 200 million. Tim has given tons and tons and tons of advice over the years, be it through his podcast, interviews, TV show, books, blog, or homemade videos. So picking a handful of the best for this show hasn't been easy. This episode features eight lessons from Tim, but as you'll hear, he has so, so many more to share. So to find out more about Tim, you should head over to his website, tim.blog, where you'll find all the links to his work. And now, in the words of the man himself, without further ado, we bring you Tim Ferriss. Number one, have high expectations of yourself. In high school, I was very bad at standardized testing. I remember going into the guidance counselor when I was about to apply for college. And uh, in preparation, they had said, come in with your safety schools, like the C list. Mm -hmm. Come in with your I think I can get in schools, B, and then your reach schools, A. And so I came in, and I had my list. And uh, on the reach were schools like Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, et cetera. And the guidance counselor said, Tim, uh, you should take your C's and make them your A's. So your safety schools, those are gonna be your reach schools. And you need to lower your standards. Like you need to, uh, you need to lower your expectations. And I walked out really demoralized. I never went back to meet him a second time. And then this is what I realized. Guidance counselors want to be able to say a high percentage of their students got into their first choice schools. What's the easiest and laziest way to do that? It's to get students to lower their goals and expectations. That is terrible advice for students. You went to Princeton. I went to Princeton. This is from Larry Page, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, what people miss about having a huge, audacious goal is that it's hard to fail completely. Number three, don't be ignorant of the rule that rules the world, the 80-20 principle. I apply the 80-20 principle to everything. And the 80-20 principle, in brief, means that 20% of your actions or inputs or products or services will create 80% of what you want, whatever that happens to be. So if I have 10 products, and those 10 products are taking up all of my time, working 100-hour weeks. So let's say 100 products that are uh, creating 100-hour weeks. Chances are, if I did an analysis, I'd find out that 20 of those products are producing 90% of my profits, which means, hypothetically, I could cut out 80% of my products, just get rid of them. Pull the trigger, get rid of them, make 90% of what I'm making now, and work 20 hours a week instead of 100 hours a week. I do that for everything. So, who are the customers who complain? I'll, I'll spec it out and try to figure out what is the profile of the 20% of customers who create 80% or 90 or 100% of my headache, and then get rid of them, figure out a way. Uh, I apply that to marketing spend, I apply that to advertising, everything. And I, I do that on a once weekly or once every two weeks basis. It's very, very important. Number six, one of the key differences between those who go far and those who don't is the ability to ask great questions. I find that levels of success in almost any industry or area correlate to a person asking great questions. 
In some cases, they seem absurd. In fact, the hallmark, in a way, of great questions is that they sound completely ridiculous. So someone might ask, like, Peter Thiel, why can't you achieve your 10-year goals in the next six months? As a thought exercise, that's a, that's, that's a good question to answer for yourself. Uh, and these types of questions come up surprisingly often uh, with, with very, very impressive folks, whether it's in business, military, entertainment, or otherwise. And the way you can get better at questions is by studying interviews in part. So I studied Larry King, I studied Charlie Rose, I studied Terry Gross, I studied da 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 da, da go down the list. Uh, I studied Tony Robbins, who does in-person, one-on-one interventions at his events in front of 10,000, 5,000 people. And he's just genius with how he uses questions to like pattern interrupt and grab someone's attention and divert them in a more product- productive direction. Now, why is that relevant? It's relevant because thinking is the process of asking questions. You're asking yourself questions and then you're answering them in your own head. So if you get better at asking other people questions, you get better at asking yourself questions, which means you are a, you're improving your thought performance and level of thinking. Number four, let the small fires burn to prevent a big one destroying everything. In other words, get into the habit of letting small bad things happen. In a world where people expect immediate responses, oftentimes and increasingly so, you have to, I believe, let small bad things happen constantly to have any agenda of your own and to get the big positive things done. So it's, it's recognizing that to prevent all hurt feelings all mistakes, all problems, all of this is impossible. And if you try to do that, you will never have a proactive schedule of your own uh, is extremely important. So effectively just saying, I'm going to accept the collateral damage and believe that what I'm embarking upon is worth more than those minor or reversible problems and then forging ahead. That's it. You gotta take a few flesh wounds. Number five. Schedule blocks of time. Large, uninterrupted blocks of time. You have to schedule, if you are a creator, blocks of time that are at least two to four hours or more in length. No Frankenstein monster of 20 minute breaks and 10 minute breaks combined into three hours will have the value of an uninterrupted block of three hours. If you are trying to make high level decisions, focus on time consuming, high priority projects, Uh, push something to a next milestone as a maker creator. We all have the same 24 hours in the day. And if you're like, I don't have time, I can't sleep, I need to cut back on sleep, I need to do this, I need to do that. If you don't have time, you don't have priorities. That's it. Number seven, don't be blinded by your optimism. Optimism has a place. But I think even more so for the first time entrepreneur, you need to be pragmatically pessimistic. What I mean by that is you need to define all of the worst case scenarios in terms of financial loss, time loss, etc. Look at what you will learn if that happens and accept and come to terms with that before you ever start. If you don't do that and you go straight into battling the world, trying to conquer the world with rose colored glasses on, the first time you hit a major hiccup, you're going to become really demoralized and you will quit. So optimism, all that rah, 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 that's awesome. But you need to hope for the best and prepare for the worst before you ever get started. I always recommend that. Number two, ideas are worth nothing. It's the execution that matters. Ideas are worth nothing. I mean, ideas are really they're not a dime a dozen, they're just nothing. All the good founders I know, even the bad founders, can come up with ideas all day long. It doesn't mean anything. You have to be able to execute. Uh, and you know, one of the, the sort of maxims that I was told once was, you know, your success will be measured in the number of uncomfortable conversations you're willing to have. So I often get asked if an entrepreneur should say, start a business based on one of their passions, or if they should find the most attractive market opportunity and build a business out of that, whether they like it or not. Uh, I don't think it's either or, I think you need both. I would say look at your own credit card statement. Identify where you spend an unusual percentage of your income, where you price insensitive, then how old are you, what gender are you, where do you live, and 
design a product that has all of those things intersecting. Number eight, successes are built upon foundations of failures. Failure would be a big piece, even though I, I view failure differently than I think many people. I view it as a feedback mechanism, but if you look at even, let's say, the four hour work week, didn't start off called the four hour work week. It was also turned down by 26 out of 27 publishers, and uh, hopefully, pretty soon, it'll be celebrating four years unbroken on the New York Times bestseller list. And I like to, whenever possible, illustrate those failures because people will, all, everyone will face failure or mistakes. And those are the divergent points from which they can either go in a good direction or a bad direction. And I want to illustrate that oftentimes the finish line is only 100 feet from where you stand, but it might seem that it's 100 miles away. If you like this podcast and would like to see more of them, there are many ways you can support it. You can leave a review on iTunes, our website, or wherever else the podcast appears. You can share it with friends on social media or on your own blog or podcast. You can purchase any books we recommend via the Amazon link on our website, in which we'll receive a small commission. Or you can support us directly with a donation. You can do that at prestopost.org forward slash support. As always, thank you for listening.